Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I'm your host. And I am always looking for ways, as I tell you every single week, ways to work smarter. And sometimes it seems obvious, and sometimes we have to uh, lift up the, the rocks and we have to really look for it. And uh, today's an interesting topic because uh, we're going to talk about memory and how uh, having a better memory and being able to recall things faster is going to help us to take back time in that context. And I'm excited to have uh, Chester Santos with us. He's an expert in this space. Uh, he, he basically uh, was featured in Time Magazine for his ability to remember numbers and uh, in a special edition for the science of memory, right? So uh, he's, he says here that uh, he's an international man of memory and he's left an impression on all the corners of the earth. So we'll hear more about that. And uh, he's been uh, basically shared his skills and expertise with CNN, ABC, PBS, NBC, CBS, and the list goes on uh, for, you know, uh, his memory building tips and, and tricks. So uh, without further ado, Chester, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Penny. I'm looking forward to talking with you today. So, you know, how did you get involved in this whole science of memory? Why was this important to you? Yeah, so how I got into the field was pretty random. I saw a segment on ABC's 2020, that evening news show on the United States National Memory Championship. It sparked my interest because I would often get the comment from people, wow, you have a really good memory. So when I saw that episode, I thought maybe I could compete, but I, I quickly found out that I, I was nowhere near the level of the best people in the United States. They were memorizing hundreds of names, uh, 50 line poems, decks of playing cards, and just minutes perfectly. So that's when I started doing research into the science of memory. How can I improve my memory from where it was. I eventually did manage to win the United States Memory Championship. And since then I've spent the last 12 plus years training other people around the world and how they can develop powerful memory skills and use those skills to become more successful in their career, personal life, and also to help their kids out or grandkids in school. Um, I've presented now in more than 30 different countries for various types of organizations. So this is a skill that we can learn and build, right? So I think a lot of people think, well, you know, I just have a bad memory and that's it, right? That's what I, that's the way I was born. So what, what would you say to those people that, that just say, I, I just don't have it? Yeah, so it's really, uh, memory is really a skill that anyone at all can develop. There are just three simple principles that you really need to keep in mind. One, turn information into visuals. So whether it's to remember names, to get more out of business networking, whether it's presentations, minimizing the amount of notes to be a more effective, more persuasive speaker, or it's re remembering processes, procedures to save time on the job. How many, how many time, how much time do you waste looking up the same information over and over again? Because <laughs> you just totally. can't, because you just can't remember it, right? Right. You'll just, you'll just use these principles. Um, and you're going to be so much more efficient, save a lot of time. So turn whatever the information is into visuals. Well, a quick example, one, right? that's number one. Number yeah. One. Yep. Number one, visual. So if you're in the case of names, Mike, uh, somebody named Mike, you might visualize a microphone. Someone named Alice, you might picture a white rabbit. Maybe that would remind you of uh, Alice in Wonderland, right? So visuals, uh, second principle, try from there to involve additional senses if you can. As you do that, you're activating more areas of your brain and you're building more and more connections in your mind to the information. So I starred in an episode of PBS's Nova Science. They had me come on, perform some memory feats, and then train David Pogue. Also, people might know him from New York Times, CBS News. After that, they had some brain scientists come on and explain, all right, how, how did Chester do that? How, how was David Pogue able to pull those feats off as well with just a little training. And these brain scientists confirmed it's because with these techniques that I've mastered over the years and that I train people in, you're using more of the brain. And part of that is learning to use more senses in order to activate more of your brain. So that's the second thing. So, well, the first one, let me just stop you there to make sure that people, because you did a great job 
helping us to understand, you know, Alice, you can picture a rabbit and then you've got, you know, Alice in Wonderland. Um, how do we incorporate more senses? Because visual is one of those senses, senses, right? Is visualizing it. So are you saying that I need to be able to smell it or touch it or like, how do we do that? Exactly. So in the case of the white rabbit, uh, at first you would visualize the white rabbit, but then also imagine that you can smell the rabbit. Maybe even imagine that you're petting the rabbit. You can feel the fur. So they've actually done experiments in the lab where they will have someone touch something. They can see exactly what area of the brain lights up. They will then have that person merely imagine that they're touching something and the same exact area of the brain lights up. So in fact, when you imagine smell, taste, touch, etc., you are activating more and more areas of your brain. So add so to if that. If I wanted to energy. remember your name, for instance, so to use those two, I could picture a chestnut and then I could smell the roasted chestnuts, kind of like have that and then be able to say, okay, chest, chester, right? So something exactly. like that. Yeah. So as you, so you started off with visualizing the chestnut, but as you add more senses to that mental imagery, you will be activating more areas of your brain. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what's the third principle? The third principle is while you are seeing and experiencing all of this in your mind, try to make it weird, unusual, extraordinary in some way, because there is a psychological aspect to human memory. If right now in the room that you're in, and if you know people that are following along with the interview, if in the room that they're in, an elephant suddenly crashed into the room right now and started spraying water all over the place with this trunk, if that actually happened at this moment, you would probably remember that for the rest of your life and always tell that story. You, you know, 40 years from now, I had this memory guy on my show and an elephant just crashed into the room while it was going on. And that would be stuck there forever without you even trying to commit it to memory, right? So to this day, scientists don't understand how it works, but just realizing that there is that psychological aspect to human memory we can harness it and apply it to training material, uh, facts and figures, processes, procedures, and so on. So that's the third principle. So I've heard people, and I don't know if this goes into special, where they use um, uh, locations. Is that part of visualization? So like I might take each corner of the room and I might uh, put a certain name or, or something and use the room that I'm in to kind of visualize and use that. Is, is that one of those kinds of techniques that you're talking about? So really, the three main principles that I just went over will always apply no matter the specific memory technique that you end up using. You described just now a very specific technique called the method of loci, Roman room method. Nowadays, modern memorizers call it the journey method. But this, this originated with the ancient Greeks. It was known as the method of loci. L-O-C-I meaning location. So it is using locations from your environment okay. to store information. You may have heard of it referred to as the memory palace technique. So that technique, I would use it when there are large, very large bodies of data involved. But really when you're just getting started with developing your memory skills, I would uh, better recommend something called the story method. And I thought maybe we could try an exercise that your uh, audience can also follow along with when they watch this or listen to this interview. Do it. I'm going to have you try to memorize very quickly the, the whole exercise um, start to finish should take about five minutes. I'm going to have you try to commit to memory the following long random list of words. It's going to be monkey, iron, rope, kite, house, paper, shoe, worm, envelope, pencil, river, rock, tree, cheese, and dollar. Now, how most people would approach that, they would write it out over and over again, recite it to themselves over and over right. again, or just read it until they feel that they've drilled it into their head, right? Right, and good luck That's that you're going to try to get me to do this, as my <laughs> memory is uh, is not so good. So this is a perfect uh, perfect example. <laughs> You'll You'll, you'll have it down, believe it or not, in about Perfect. three minutes or so. So a lot of people, you know, when I have live audiences and I can see every, everyone's face, they look at me at this point in the presentation like, nope, this, that's not going to happen. Uh, good luck. That's what I was thinking. No. Yeah, that's, that's the, the first reaction. But really, you're going to just try to keep those three main principles in mind. And I'm going to guide you through creating a little story in your mind. That's all. Okay. okay? Just 
relax, have fun. It will be easy. So the first word that I had given you was monkey. I want for you to just visualize in your mind a monkey, okay? okay? You see that in your head, there's a monkey and it's dancing around. Yeah, even imagine that it's making monkey noises, right? right. Ooh, 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 whatever a monkey would sound like, yeah. So let's see and hear that monkey in our mind. The monkey now picks up a gigantic iron because that was the next word. So just imagine that the monkey's dancing around with this giant iron. The iron starts to fall, but a rope attaches itself to the iron. Maybe even feel the rope. Maybe it feels sort of rough. Interact with that rope. Okay. You look up the rope. You see that the other end of the rope is attached to a kite. Maybe you reach up and try and touch the kite, but it's out of your reach. All right. That okay. kite. See the kite. The kite now, it crashes into the side of a house. Really, just see it in your mind smash into that house. The house, you notice, is completely covered in paper for some weird reason. It's covered in paper. Picture that as best you can. Next word I had given was paper. Out of nowhere, out of thin air, a shoe appears, and it starts to walk all over the paper. Maybe it's messing up the paper as it's walking on it, that shoe. The shoe smells pretty badly, so you decide to investigate and see why. You look inside of the shoe, and you find a little worm. Just really see that smelly worm. The worm now jumps out of the shoe and into an envelope. Maybe it's going to mail itself or something. I don't know. Envelope was the next word. All right. So see the envelope. A pencil appears out of nowhere and it starts to write all over the envelope. Maybe it's addressing it or something. That pencil. The pencil now jumps into a river and there's a huge splash like you would never expect to see from that little pencil when it hits the river. The river, you notice, is crashing up against a giant rock. It's crashing up against a giant rock. That rock flies out of the river. Now it crashes into a tree. This tree is growing cheese. You probably haven't seen a tree like that. It's growing cheese. And out of each piece of cheese shoots a dollar, right? So the last word actually was dollar. I'm going to run through this again in about 30 seconds now. And as I do, you're just going to replay through this story that you've created in your mind. So we started off with a monkey. What was the monkey dancing around with? It was an iron. What then attached to the iron? It was a rope. The other end of the rope, what did you see? It was a kite. Kite. The kite then crashed into something, yeah, a house. What was the house covered in? It was covered paper. in paper. Something walked on the paper. What was it? It was a shoe, shoe, right? It was walking on there. Something crawled inside of the shoe. What was it? It was a worm. The worm jumped into the envelope. envelope. What wrote on the envelope? It was a pencil. pencil. The pencil jumped into the river. river. The river was crashing into the rock. rock. The rock flew into the tree. tree. The tree was growing cheese, and what came out, it was a dollar. So now, it should be pretty easy now to recall the entire random list of words by simply playing through the story in your mind, and each major object that you encounter in the story will give you the next word. So just give it a try now, Penny. Take your time. Do your best, and people listening or watching to the interview, the interview later can follow along, see how they do. Okay. So we had a monkey, the monkey had an iron and the iron was attached to a rope. And the rope, uh, hold on, don't tell me. So the rope had a kite, it was attached to a kite. The kite hit the house and the house was wrapped in paper and the paper uh, had shoes. And then there was a worm and then there was an envelope and there was a pencil. And then there was the river, and then there was a rock, and then there was a tree, and then there was cheese and a dollar. 100% correct. Wow. 100% correct. Wow. Really I, well it's done, impressive. Man. If you got me to do that, then I, <laughs> I'm impressed. I think, uh, trust me, people, you're listening, you're watching. I am just, a, I, when he first read that list, I mean, I, I couldn't even remember the first one. I thought the first one was a rope, right? In the beginning when you were going. Uh -huh, yeah. So uh, that that's pretty impressive. Very well done there. Under pressure too. I just sprung that on you. You didn't didn't know that we were going to end up doing that. So 
Uh, really well done there. And I'm sure that people following along with the interview got most, if not all of those correct. Now, I just want to make it clear to people that, you know, we're almost out of time. I think with the interview, it's a short interview, but yeah. that's why I just did random words with the story method. But this can be applied to anything at all, even very complex types of information. Harvard hired me to give seminars for their graduate students. If people visit my website, they'll see a testimonial from the Harvard Graduate Council. It's just about learning how to take it a little bit further. Those images, then you turn them into mental note cards or mental cue cards. So you might, if you're going to give a talk, for instance, about healthcare in the U.S., you might start out with the stethoscope that the doctor would use to check your heartbeat. Stethoscope just reminds you of the broad topic of healthcare. Right. The first thing you're going to cover in your speech or presentation is the high cost of healthcare in the U.S. Maybe shooting out of the stethoscope is a bunch of $100 bills. Next, you want to cover that in order to get certain things covered, sometimes we have to find a way to navigate through or cut through red tape. Maybe wrapping itself around the $100 bills is all this red tape. So that should give you an idea of how you could minimize notes or how those images could represent steps and uh, processes, procedures, things like that. Take a few minutes and down the line, you will save so much time. So let's just talk about practical application. Like you talked about if you were presenting, right? You could put it into a story and like all these things are coming to my mind. Like when you talk about a process, like companies could be enlisting this into their training to help people remember the safety procedures, for instance, right? And just to walk through it instead of, uh, sometimes people don't follow the checklist that they're supposed to follow so that they can be trained in a way where at least mentally they, they have these things in their head that they have to follow. So um, is, is that something that you see that this is incorporated into uh, company training and things like that? Yeah, so that's one of my areas of focus, corporate training. This is huge for company training. You know, you're definitely going to make your employees more productive. If you are investing, if a company is investing in training your employees, sending them to other trainings, they're going to retain much more of that information if they go through memory skills training uh, first. So it's really huge in terms of getting employees to remember key information for sure. And, and again, it takes a little bit of time to develop the skills, but once you've developed the skills down the line, you're going to be, you're going to save so much time and be more productive. Absolutely. So I, I just wanted to point out, we talked about how you can use it for yourself, right? And you talked about networking and some other applications. So there's corporate use for this in terms of the training. And then something that comes to my mind also is, uh, is, is for leaders, right? I know that one of the things I do when I'm working with people and I'm looking to bring a point across is I, I like to use visuals because people will remember it. So like I'll hand everybody a Rubik's cube and then I'll tell a whole story and a series of points that I want them to remember around the Rubik's cube. And I find that uh, when I go in and I, I do a presentation or, or something around leadership, I find that even a year later, people have the Rubik's Cube with them and they remember, you know, a couple of pieces because it was attached to, to a visual. Yes, excellent. I love that. I love that you're doing that. Visuals are very powerful. Yes, this is really good leadership training as well. Again, to be a more effective presenter. Also, sometimes CEOs hire me because they want to know, they really want to know the names of their employees and right. things about them because it really helps to show that they really appreciate those employees and their work. So it helps to uh, develop better business relationships. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Uh, you know, I, I think that at first thought, people don't appreciate how we can use these memory skills really to, uh, to, to our advantage, as you said, to be more, more productive. But before we close out today, I just have a couple quick questions for you so that I ask uh, almost all of my guests. So tell me, what's your definition of productivity and why? Yeah, uh, my definition, I think, of productivity is spending th uh, time on things that will in some way further your career, business, professional, and or personal development. Uh, and doing that in, I, I guess, the most efficient way, in a way that in which you are saving time. In the end, it will end up saving you time. So I guess it's totally, my definition is in totally in line with what I described for the benefits of memory skills really is that 
something might take your time at first, but in the end, if it saves you time, I feel that time was very productive that you spend right. on doing it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, what's your, maybe it goes without saying what your topic is, but what's your shortcut? Like, you know, everybody's got something that there's their go-to shortcut to save them uh, time, money, effort, whatever. Yeah. So my shortcut is the same that I would recommend for people, you know, people that attend my presentations and people that I train. And that is to, you know, figure out what it is that you're looking up over and over again, just spend, uh, you know, even an hour or less, if you've developed these skills, committing that to memory, and that's going to be a huge shortcut for you. So one quick example, I don't, I think people can relate to it just in everyday life. So I travel a lot to give presentations around the world. And I always laugh when we have to fill out the landing cards when you're entering a new country. And I see people, you know, looking through their bags, trying to find their passport. And I just fill it out in like 30 seconds because it's all committed to memory. Um, you know, that's it, checking in. Sometimes they want the confirmation number and you see people trying to find it on their phone or maybe their phone's dead and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know where, it, but I just right away give it from memory so there are it's my shortcut and gotcha. i think people can uh kind of relate to that right totally well i guess i figured that but i had to ask <laughs> if um what's the you know one or two apps that if your phone and your computer were erased and you had to reinstall everything what what are the top two apps that you would be installing that support you the mail app is the one that I really use all the time. Uh, that's my important app. I saw this movie recently. Some people saw it, probably the, the social dilemma and that we're maybe a, bit, <laughs> a little bit too distracted and kind of addicted to social media. So wouldn't definitely wouldn't be um, like Facebook or something like that. But the email, I feel is incredibly important to my business and to everyone's business. So the email app, and if it had to be more of a, a social media type one, just LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is really good for business. Do you have one that you use that helps you be, uh, you know, more efficient at email? Like, like uh, you know, like there's some cool tools out there like uh, uh, Grammarly, for instance, so that you have accurate grammar. Like, are there any of those types of apps that you, you might add that, um, that improve your work? Yeah, definitely from a, and this is from a productivity uh, perspective, mm -hmm. I use Boomerang for Gmail mm -hmm. that allows you to schedule the emails because I work, you know, as a one man business, sometimes I'm, I'm wanting to write an email or I get an idea at two or 3am or something, but it doesn't seem like anyone would see the email that then I can just schedule it to go out at eight or 9am. So that's a useful one, uh, an email scheduling app. Absolutely. I just want to highlight and, and mention something about email scheduling, uh, and then we'll then we'll close out today's show. Because I think you know bringing that up is really important. Not only does it get it off your shoulders, right, that you don't have to worry about it anymore. You know that it's scheduled, so you don't have to put it on a to do list and uh, yeah. you know remember to do it. Even though uh, I know that you're the memory guy, right? But yeah. uh, it also takes up energy to have to remember a lot of different things. So let's make things easier for ourselves. And it Definitely. also doesn't create an urgency in someone else at a time when it's not urgent. I think that's yep. a really important thing is because we, we have a challenge where everything is urgent these days, right? And that's why we're constantly distracted by, oh, you know, there's a uh, oh, today's Cyber Monday, right? So we've got we've to run out and buy something even though we might not need anything, but it's 30% off. It creates yeah. that, that level of urgency. And when you schedule those emails to go out at a reasonable time, it's not interrupting somebody or making them feel like there's an urgency that they have to respond to. So I think it's also respectful to, to others as well as a tool for yourself. Yeah, yeah, so I love that one. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your, you know, these great tips. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed and I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be practicing. Uh, thank so, you. so tell people, you know, where can they contact you and get more information about you? Yeah. If people would like to go deeper with this memory skills development, my main training website is memoryschool.net. Uh, I would visualize a giant 
fishing net maybe to remember that's .net. So it's memoryschool.net and I set up a coupon code Penny in honor of being on your show. So anyone, well, actually not anyone, I set it up for 25 uses. You have to okay. indicate how many times it can be used. So the first 25 people to use code Penny will be able to start without any enrollment fee. So check it out if you're interested. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for having me. My pleasure. And thank you all for being here. You know that you're always going to get something good here, right? So continue to keep coming back. Uh, make sure you subscribe. We're also available on uh, YouTube. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel as well as wherever you get your podcast, uh, whether it's uh, iTunes or Spotify or uh, a lot of those Stitcher, a lot of the popular, we're, we're there. So your challenge this week to put that into practice and see how many things that you can put into. So memorizing people's names is a great example. If you're, if you're in a team and a wider team, uh, what, what are some things that you can do to put this uh, memory to use? How can you improve your presentation skills and, and, and those types of things? So really look for practical uses this week of where you can put that into practice. So my name is Penny Zanker, and this is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode.